So hello everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here on behalf of Early Poetry Bookshop. We want to welcome you all here tonight for um, this wonderful launch that Arden Letters is putting out. And um, thank you for being the first uh, audience we've had in Grolier in over a year. So it feels really good to be back and um, enjoy the reading. Thank you so much. Turn it over to Philip Nikolaev, who will be introducing all the poets. Actually, a small matter of the order of the readers. Alphabetical. Okay, so, okay. Oh, we're alphabetical. Okay. So, Raquel. 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 So, I'll just um, um, say, should I keep this on while I'm speaking? You can take it off when you're speaking. Okay. Six feet apart. Just briefly, you know, I, I care about poetry, and in particular, I care about younger poets because I like to steal from them, you know. <laughs> um, I like to check out their ideas and to, they, they, they can be, you know, when, when Picasso was kind of at the height of his powers, he once confessed this, he would go to younger artists' exhibitions and understand everything they were doing while they could still not understand. <laughs> uh, so, not to make any megalomaniacal parallels here, uh, I'll say that I it just happened to know poets, and in particular I know some young poets, and I thought the ones that I included in this anthology of 14, uh, seven of them from the West and seven from India, uh, were good, strong poets that deserved attention. And it all started by me putting together one of those Zoom, uh, Zoom readings. I was doing a lot of Zoom readings about a year ago because we were at the height of the pandemic and so on. And so I put together this uh, reading of 14 poets. Um, and uh, after that, first of all, the, the video went sort of moderately viral on social media. It got thousands of views. Um, and uh, very quickly, a group of us emerged in social media, all, all these, you know, without my participation at first, of the younger poets who self-organized into this kind of suddenly coherent and cohesive community of poets. And I think they've become something of a of a unity, some form of unity for all their diversity and so on. I really like what they're doing, and I will let their poems and I guess their bios to speak for themselves. Uh, what's the best way to do it? Should I introduce everyone? And, or should I um, introduce everyone individually? Ben, what's your opinion? Um, introduce everybody at the start, but announce each reader. Okay, fair enough, that's a good point. So I will, I will tell you then a bit about them. All the, this information is at the back of the anthology, which I hope you will acquire if you have not yet. Um, and thank you very much for coming. I'm actually looking forward to hearing this in real life as opposed to on Zoom. Raquel Balboni is from around here, and her first collection of poems, Triple X Poems, from Arts and Letters 2020. And her poems have appeared in Brooklyn Rail, Spoke, Dick Boston, The Cafe Review, Arts and Letters, Geontology, The Boston Compass, New England Review of Books, and the anthology Boston by, uh, from Dostoevsky Wannabe last year. She is the co-publisher of Art and, Art and Letters, the Boston-based press, and she co-edits the monthly poetry column in the Boston Compass. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Justin, do I say Burnett or Burnett? Burnett. Burnett. Okay. Uh, Justin Burnett is a poet and visual artist from Marblehead, Massachusetts. Blake Campbell uh, has had writing that has appeared in or is forthcoming in Painted Bright Quarterly, The Dark Horse, The Worcester Review, Measure Review, Lambda Literary, and Fulcrum. A Pushcart Prize nominee, he's the recipient of the 2015 Aliki Perotti and Seth Frank Most Promising Young Poets Award from the Academy of American Poets and a 2020 Emerging Artist Award from the St. Rudolph Club Foundation. 
He lives in Salem, Massachusetts. Emily Grachowski, do you say it with a ch or a sh? Uh, Grachowski. Grachowski, gotcha, thank you. Emily Grachowski, thank you. Is an experimental poet receiving her bachelor's, well, I think you've received your bachelor's degree pretty well, then. okay. She has received her bachelor's degree in creative writing from Emerson College in December 2020. And uh, her poetry has been published in Dead River Review and La Guagua Poetry Anthology, Celebration and Confrontation. Oh, is Paul here? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. It's so nice to, so nice to see you, man. It's been too long. I didn't see you. Nice to... <laughs> Paul Rowe lives on, on the North Shore of Massachusetts and works at Endicott College, Merrimack College, and Jabberwocky Bookshop. His work is featured in Literary Imagination, Moonchild Magazine, Minor Literatures, 3AM Magazine, Cog and Wooperville, and Cog and Wooperville. Paul is editor of the anthology Boston, published by Dostoevsky One. And last but not least, Sam Bernowski born in 1993, a poet living in Boston, Mass, but not currently, right? Where are you now? Uh, well, I'm in uh, Long Island. Long Island, at the moment. His work has appeared in the journals After the Post, Unoya Review, and Boston Compass, among others. After spending the past two years researching theoretical computer science at the CUNY Graduate Center, he will be continuing his PhD in the Applied Mathematics Department of Stony Brook University in the fall of 2021, which is currently in progress. Um, I give you Raquel Balboni first. Cadillac Mountain occurs all the way around, 
in the red cartoon portraiture of Midnight Young, adventuring and playing dead under the bridge. The midnight eyes found you, darling, crouching like a bug. In the triangular shadow of highbrow and low down, you were there somewhere in between the miscellaneous being, dragging on and on and never taking the scene away. And I can never forgive you for doing that to me. Um, I think the last poem I'll read tonight, um, it's called Sensibilities. People fall for it so easily. Other people screaming in the dark, finding the light in the long hallway, louder up north, colder in a circle of screaming. At the end, of the big pole and falling release. Horror following along the blue end of the track. The nails are all twisting towards me. There is a place to go. There could be a bad time without a good exit strategy. There is a pain without direct combat, soothing down the patch in the middle. What happens stays happening sitting down and screaming. Thank you, everybody. being summation and the exponential value. Use it for H. pylori. I do every day. I can see you have inflammation. Why? Why? It is formulaic. I reviewed your history. Black and white. Black and blue. An x-ray. Oh, what I saw. You see? There, there. Cancer unfurling like rainbows through mist. Let Y2 be flat. Let all expectation sit like a unit, unpigmented possible mode. There is no Z-axis wheelchair, you and imaginary numbers. This poem is called Wilmot. She was flowered, drenched in water, and laughed at and left to die. She could not climb out of the hole. The pace sat on her like the weight of her father when she told him what she was, brimming like the thread of real stones. She attempted, she, she attempted to sift the grains of herself through the barrier, which was herself. Let them disperse into void and be brought back to set foot on Gallows Hill. Then let me work. Try though she did, she could not do this. She had not the strength to wrench being right now. She felt infantile, bare, intolerably, a fawn unsticking herself from the excessive wound. She screamed at every tug, it was fruitless. She screamed at the boys who would come back and throw bloody rocks. She screamed, could she get her hands on them and shred? And then the stone began to mutter to convey northeast wind. The hole was not so deep that it was dark all around. The air held some light. She slowed, breaking into herself a bit more. She clenched her nails into her arms, squatted and rocked, reddening the flower, looking up at the joist. There were five, column-wise to Wilmot, and the roof was thatch. She had an intimacy with straw thatch and set her mind there. Intimacy. Oh, how it thumped and stuck in my back. One or two admirers, a mess, a searing elation. Above her head, the roof began to weave and rustle. Three strands were coiling into loose for his chin braid. He cast it down like a rope to a friend in a dark place, and she could feel herself smiling to catch it. He fastened it, breathing just below her ear. He kissed her and took her breath away. She was all butterflies and weak in the knees. But as she was strung up, she, whis she whispered in his ear what she would do for him. Your prayer and your devotion, he said, are granted even as you whispered it to me. And she was gently footed in the barn. She stood for a minute and walked to the open door. 
And this is a long poem from the book called Witchcraft Heights. It's about this kind of suburban area of Salem. And I found myself there a lot during the pandemic. Just kind of a little scraggly second growth in this land. Witchcraft Heights. It was because of the way I saw the world that they hated me. They could not have been any clearer upon this point. Heretic, believer, conservative, liberal to a fault, in an appellate court, they drove me to the Badlands to express opinions there. The road had been cut by one slicer, birches and invasive altissima, hewn in half, blackened as the blade was hot. I hoofed it up tonnages of gravel through clouds of bugs to the water tower. Leashless dogs and maskless people with kids came out of cleavages, which led nowhere but to groups of birches like candlesticks with tiny scarves. And their vestal tenders so tired from worshiping, they were all in sleeping bags. The Phoebe sang quiet, humming songs through bands of sunlight at the treetops. I thought a prayer and retraced my steps. Farther up the hill under the power lines are these telekinetically carnivorous plants, which must grow favorably in the heats cast up by the gravel. They look only a little otherworldly, from Arizona, say. Spike pods opening fast as the sun going down. Only the top two bloom in yellow. What they do is catch butterflies by the proboscis when they come for nectar, then sear the souls out of them, growing new pods with each one they divest. Husks still hang from a few. Being almost weightless, their dance is erratic in the wind. You think that they're alive, and you wonder what color they used to be now that they've purpled into black and brown. Atop the hill is the round blue tower, the painted witch bakes in the afternoon of slanting light. And there are other paths with greater congregations at rest, out of the wind, amid the tall grass, under the scraggle trees. Only a shopping bag rustled lightly as I checked in on them, like a benevolent fawn, though I couldn't help it, they needed me. Nobody talks, the dog walkers, lawbreakers come and go. The sleeping bags never move. I hear the wild goose constantly announce its migration. Christ couldn't lay his head anywhere, and I have no place to sleep. The city of peace has forsaken me, even the generic suburbia that is witchcraft heights. With the rock in my hand, I curl up beneath the concrete base of the metal stand of connected lines. The hunger starts to hurt. Thank you. Next comes Blake, Blake Campbell. He hails from Salem, Mass. Um, I'm going to get started with two poems from the anthology, Crane Beach. On the beach, the sandy wind falls and rises in the thin ranks of grass that crown the dunes, where the piping plover croons, and its efforts inexact, fashioning a ventifact from this cloudy shard of quartz, billowing our shirts and shorts as it blows in from the sea, mime you're putting up with me, and my putting up with you. Though the wind may chill us through, edges soften in its surge, where the sea and sand converge, and the sand's corrosive sting leaves behind a polished thing. Um, the next poem from the anthology I'm going to read is called the prism, um, and it is a dream poem set in an office building. A building like a prism of the mind, all offices. The dream admits us both. The sun is mine alone that speeds the growth of notions I refuse to leave behind. Glass entrances, glass exits, Double takes and sneers alike reflected on display. The lobby's love seats all upholstered gray and 
thriving potted plants that look like fakes. You sit but fidget, glancing at a glass revolving door that seems to never stop when business women spin it like a top and spin the sunlight with it as they pass. Content to take things slow, we do not touch. Some interview awaits me up above, a prospect more auspicious than our love, but nothing that excites me very much. You say I'll surely ace it. How the sun spends its abundance, brightening your eyes. Your beauty I have yet to memorize from every angle. How could anyone? And must I waste my life here, wanting more? Or wait for cloud and shadow to erase the specters of the sun that stain your face and throw their shades like seeds across the floor? The silence drones between us, incomplete negation, but negation just the same. The man at the front desk calls out my name, but you're the one who hurries to his feet. Reluctantly, I follow you. I rack my head for what to say and come up short. You manage one stiff hug, a sharp retort, and give yourself away. With one look back, your pupils shrink to pinpoints, marble blue flooding the limits of ink with something else. The sunlight strikes and cuts itself, compels the glass revolving door to double you. The um, last three that I'm going to read are newer poems in kind of freer verse forms. Um, this next one is called Know Thy Past, that's N-O Thy Past. Um, it's a poem about a painting by um, a Salem artist by the name of Quentin Oliver Jones. Know Thy Past. Here is a house. Or is it the barn you were born in? Neither the vanishing nor focal point, it hangs at the center, where panes of pulsing color converge, extract the simple fact of architecture from an impossible background. Here is a structure recollection rescued from the usual domestic mess, the human complications. But soon, the pains that frame it flash to accentuate only themselves, and the house, if it is a house, must suffer continual erasure, must suffer if it hopes to be renewed. Um, the next poem is one from Coal Country in Pennsylvania where I grew up. Um, this is a poem about the furnace in my childhood home. It's called the furnace. My father had to feed it to keep it from killing us, to keep the gas from seeping into the basement, into the house. He shoveled each truckload of anthracite toward the center of the bin, where the auger spun a slow whirlpool of fossil fuel, funneled it into the flame. Twice a day, he had to fill the hole against the fumes, the coals burning in darkness, turning to poison. When he left, the furnace remained, survived him even, though not without effort. It groans and creaks, however much we bleed the lines, release the trapped air from pipes and radiators. The holding tank fills with water beneath my mother's bed each night. She hears its constant struggle to perform. By now, the coal that keeps us warm has come upstairs. She sees it when she cleans. How it has darkened the shelves, the chairs, the dust that settles. The last poem I'm going to read um, is another Pennsylvania poem called Deer Flies, which are little biting flies, closely related to horse flies, that are very abundant um, on the land where I grew up. 
Um, and I'm going to dedicate this one to my mother who is zooming in um, from Pennsylvania right now um, because I feel that she has lived this poem as much as I have. Deer flies. July, and the heat-seeking deer flies descend, spirits risen from black mud, where the creek's most sluggish tributaries subside into swamp. Easy to kill, but insistent, unwelcome as dream reprimands from dead family. They seem to come in greater numbers every summer, though it takes them years of maggotry to mature breaking down the forest's constant detritus. Our predecessors sank their trash into that stinking darkness, left Coke bottles, mason jars, flasks of Philip's milk of magnesia for us to unearth decades later and polish into knickknacks for the kitchen. Do these flies also have a second life? Or do they, do they presume to prepare us for hours? crawling into our hair, seeking a spot on the scalp for the first incision. I anoint myself with poison to keep them at bay, but they buzz at my ears, testing the chemical fence between us. They cling like diadems to the graying faces of the dogs, like buttons to our sweating chests, their mandibles a handmaid's pins, piercing our skin on purpose. They are dressing us up. They cannot let us pass unbitten through their grove of rhododendrons. Those who survive the swatting depart, taking a bit of us with them, mixing our blood in their bellies to feed the generations still to come. Thank you, everyone. Universal language. 
If I submit myself to silence, the null element of all spoken languages concerning the world, and silence belongs to a subset of those languages, then I know every language of the world. The proof for this can be shown through the following. X is silence, a language subset. Y is a specific language. U is the universal set of all languages. So the proof, X equals null, the nihilistic value. X is the element of Y is the element of U. If X is the element of Y, then X is the element of U. Here, silence is regarded as a null element and thus forms a separate body of language that is included in any spoken language. From this, it can be shown that if one knows the language of silence, then one knows the universal language of the world. That's the last poem I will read is called House of Wake. Uh, this comes from a diary entry I made a couple months ago. So the house of weight, weight as in burden, uh, heavy thoughts, was supposed to be an echo of the house of being, Heidegger. Uh, the house in itself is a master image. For me, it's a master image because it is vague, chaotic, beyond reach. In it, there's excess, there's measure. I moved around often as a child and felt displaced, displaced. This is where I turned from myself invent an isolated house with me. It's a house of weight. A day and night a life does not go by without a call from the house of weight. Hear the calling, do not desire it, do not want it, do not know what to, or what to do with, what not to do with, all negative weight. Finds you always like an unfailing shadow, in the servants of night, eddying infinitely at first allow the flow. Do not know how to, if how knew how to, sever off the waiting, just lie waiting in emptiness as an abandoned home. Forget of consent of existence, of consent to existence, of what life, whose life the home wants. Close to you regardless, the object unable to self-defend. Go on accepting, ravaging, drowning, darkness devouring the sunken flame, until every malady of the world finds a home in you. You who have never known of homes, you who matter distorts, you who only the void desires, makes of you this abandoned home, the house of weight, that all consigned to ruin all of us. Thank you, that's all. Stars gasp for age, 
still conjuring are we there yet from the back seats of cars where mothers never know where we are. So this is kind of like a coming of age story in reverse kind of, which is cool. Um, but I'm reading it in the, the way that it, Fallen Comets. So this poem is kind of like about how nothing really starts with you, it kind of starts like before you were born. Fallen Comets. Grass creeps out from concrete. My grandfather, with pipe in hand. Cassie, there in the yard, in stark mimicry of his contrapasto. Fallen Comet among broken bottles. Clattering of hail on a trailer. Pile of tarnished basement vinyl. Eddie Cochran, Dwayne Eddy, some neglected Polaroids, crouching epiphanies of devastated neighborhoods. How old are you? Uh, 32. I had to think about it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> the name on the letter, Eurydice. This poem actually has to do, it's for, It's actually the only poem in here that's like not from my perspective, it's written from the perspective of uh, somebody else. In my restless dreams I see the town, sliver of a chance to make it right, fulfill broken promises. A town with a special place I hold beneath clouded eyes. A town that holds the dead in like the last word withheld. So much left to say, Eurydice, rising in dreams, waiting on the silent shore. If a dead person can't write a letter, why write back? Lost, looking for the town, how many roads like this must I walk in the fog? In this restless dream, a hotel looms on the lake. I wonder if it's still there. You look like her a bit. I loved her. In my restless dreams, we stand on the bridge and make a stand against the mirror below, holding secrets of an urn awaiting tears, of a silent town awaiting your voice, of reflections that fake life in dream. Caldera. Pale light surges from the horizon line. Its glimmer ripples the water's edge in strands. Apparitions of life hastily scrawled, upon the crumpled glass of Aegean twilight. Volcanic wasps rise, sulfurous effusions. Mercurial breath that carves the crater, admits the flood, shapes the ochre crescent, mirrors what's above. The insect, the angel. Posters of Don Quixote and Wings of Desire line the walls of a lamp-lit office. Our conversations covered the Grand Inquisitor, the Twilight Zone, the Yankees and the Sox, Brooklyn, the Eternal City. The cancer had just knocked once by then, leaving its mark in creases around your eyes. It would never shake your passion for consciousness at those hours. Dimitri's I exist, the hurrah for Karamazov, the insect, the angel of every heartbeat. This is the last one I'll read. Cerebral palsy. At times, without warning, drenched, drenched in dense sheets, my brother, writhing in bed, stayed back by waves from the vast sea of language stiffens a shell to keep us safe from the body's knowledge. We wait for the voice from the sea to call forth, the light from a tower to lead him back out. Yet waves push him back to this shore, this body, this beach, this shell. The reef without language pulls us in, binds us together in blinding night. Thank you.
it's really great to be part of the uh, first in-person reading uh, since the pandemic here. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to read uh, three poems. Uh, one of the three is from the anthology, and the first two um, will be uh, other things that are really um, The first poem is called Let Us Assume, and this is one that I wrote during the pandemic. Let us assume the size of birds, the shadows they have cast, who haul the north with them across the continent, and wings that cover up the sky like dreams of airplanes <laughs> coughing over ancient battlefields. The unknown dead extended into crevices with ice pick bones still tearing from the sleeves of cotton working shirts. Suppose the roads have all been bled and you and I can thread ourselves through arteries of pulsing traffic lights and solitude. That bloodless atria of concert halls and stadiums collapse beneath the desolating surge of turbine fans. And everywhere there is no night, except the steady wail of air raid horns crying over photographs of rebar steel still twitching in the open belly of a pale leviathan. The harpoon wounds of daytime stars receding in the sun blush and forgiving vastness of its blubber. And windowed skulls of antelope indifferent to the sliding sky hang delicate as airsick bags from kindling branches. Rolling eyeballs of the clouds send nothing more than condensation through the cavities of fired bone. Assume the span of octopods, who grope the hulls of ships with loving suction cups and wrench their keels apart with twisting ropes of tentacle, whose nameless bodies sulk below them like a myth of hard hat workers laying untold lengths of fiber optic cord against the centuries. The awful dust of glass suspended in the dreams of businessmen, and callous lungs that swell like rumor over city blocks. Assume that we can walk unmasked, but hidden in the faceless crowd, like tourists lost in some Venetian carnival. Um, <clears throat> the next poem I'm going to read is called The Beef Eaters. Um, it's a response to two Japanese texts. Uh, the first is uh, in Praise of Shadows by Junichiro Tanizaki, and uh, the second is uh, called The Beef Eater, which is a short satirical vignette by Kanagaki Rogun. Um, the poem is told as a fictionalized account from a member of uh, Commodore Matthew C. Perry's uh, voyage to Japan. The Beef Eaters. In sin the ocean bore us, gunboats throbbing with anticipation, open shoulders of the waves cradling a head of steam. Edo was only as we expected it, desperate for pocket watches, buttons, the exotic ornaments we pinned to coat fronts, everything that made us decent. Stripped of these, our finest qualities were sorted into piles, beef cows, wool coats, Croatian neckties, unimaginative tangles in the lifeless sun. The paper lanterns that they used were hardly fit to light such splendor, so we strung up gas lamps to reveal our glory. Dying coals we laid to rest in boiler rooms were all we left to hold some sooty corner of a dark to hide our nakedness. Untouched like certain mirrors that they hid from us in unlit shrines, we found ourselves with nothing to reflect from all our burnished surfaces. But I've inscribed inside of oyster shells the rest, accounts of all that lights could fall on, and of things I knew that couldn't be repeated. Here I left a record of that cargo, and the flash of teeth from in a recess of such a dark that one could only say was fitting to its purpose. Or of lacquerware that I had seen and liked, I wrote perhaps a line or so, inserted them in mantle folds, then shut them up like briny jewels that only certain eyes might look upon. These and motions of a hand inside the darkness of a sleeve are only half-invented memories for those of us who chose to speak of them. In sin the ocean bore us, dying pockets in the wind falling, like a light so weak it only darkens shadows on the flawless surfaces we carry, unimaginative angles cut from lifeless sun. Um, the last poem I'm going to read is from the anthology, and it's called All the Lights Are Tricks. Remember that infinitives are forceful. 
that you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and will have mercy on whom I shall have mercy. The human spine was never meant to work this way. Some stuff that Greeks have said, your coat and keys, and me. I guess you don't. We met so long ago. Under all of this, you are a six-pound baby struggling to tell Grandpa you hated the needle. We have to do this because it was turpentine, not water. Drink the charcoal. It was rodenticide you ate, not candy like the usurper poured. All the way back to last night, the dream. You can't wake me with the second half of sentences. You have to give me the beginning, and I'll finish like an alarm clock does. The clouds came up and rained water on the bed sheets. The first half woke me, but second needn't be discussed. I don't know how many of the pricks we killed exactly, but I can't see paintings anymore and not remember it was a lot. We shelled that beach all morning like a bowl of almonds, but when we made landfall, more than all the dead, nothing prepared me for how many were alive. And I've received the sealskin boots you sent by mail and whalebone pipe and thrown the boots away because the smell was bad, and imagine where you are must be considerably cold. And, and, I enclose the poems unfinished with the current jams you like. Understand I couldn't write in such unchristian silence, and remember how in school they told me cursive would be faster once I had mastered it, and how, when I was small, I got so sick with fever, and my mother gave to me this doll, and all the doctors said that I would likely die. I hated them. They all stood quiet as a letter to a stranger. I could go on, but yes, I do recall. John New came with three marlin bills and held them up to show me how they cut through fish. And I remember how the deep was full of them. He said we'd eat like this for lifetimes if we wanted and lifted up a sawfish head, its rostral teeth overflowing from the mouth as proof of teeming oceans. And I imagined glutted seas of fish and conjured leaded clouds that rose with water that would trickle back to sea from land. I wrung them from these memories like bedsheets dredged from sand. And I remember gulper eels, the way the sea would writhe. And I invented fish that lived at depths so deep that no one could disprove. I counted slow, dispassionate, and everything. The anglerfish, their tiny males stuck half absorbed to them the eyes of some forgotten coelacanth, and all the lights that throbbed beneath this world of half-appearances and jellyfish, and how should I describe the loneliness, the horror I invented there from billfish swords and rostral teeth, or the pull of bioluminescence in so dark a place that nothing surfaces. I remember how the boats those days would dredge up everything. We watched them quiet from the docks, the men who skulked about with wicker baskets full of halibut and cusk. They traded wordlessly in gutted stairs and paper bills, and we invented stories from their lives. And I was told that father kept the magnet in his desk in case a patient came with shrapnel in his eyes, as sometimes happened to the men who stumbled from the boats. He plucked the, me the metal out, my mother said, just like the second halves of sentences. A power pulled the fragments up, inevitable, magnetic, and the clouds would rise. I haven't used the iris scissors, hemostats, or scalpel blades, but keep them here as my inheritance and sterilize. The balloons we sent up to the stratosphere with ballast bags collapsed like jellyfish beneath the weight of centuries. And now I work computers, trace trajectories of satellites across the surfaces of monitors, and know how everything will end up orbiting to maybe 20,000 iterations. And there were times I felt so sick of it I dreamed of paper maps and compasses. The unknown edges of a world so crudely drawn, they disobeyed my perfect calculus and ripped apart the ocean, split at continents. At times, I felt so sick I rolled through white-hot images of maggot legs and dreamt about an ivory ball. The dreams, the pull, the second halves of sentences, and everything came spilling out of me to fill the universe. We understand the need for unknown quantities and wonder. Things like, how am I to make things up when I have heard how they began? The clouds came up. It ran, it ran, it ran. White caps gnashed the bones of Labrador. And I, Ishmael, was among that crew that took oaths of violence and revenge, took amphetamines to stay awake, and swore at nothingness and God past 3 AM. And I remember frozen nights of telegrams the way our iron tub would heal among the waves, 
the lash of solar wind against the night, and how the constellations blinked like glassy eyes from yawning crevices. At port, we'd trade our cigarettes for warmer clothes and make up stories of a pitch and churning sea. And sometimes, after breakfast, Walt would come to me and say, how sweet to be alive and get to sleep, or to stare at open ocean from the decks of ships. And I have known the longing for the total dark that swims at depths that can't be reached by rigid things, have felt the brush of sliding forms that feel no need to choose a shape, and envied them for this. I, who wind the anchor lines and winches, and take the pulse of the abyss. Charlie, I've got dying eyes and broken teeth. I haven't anything to be excited for. But here, she tapped her head. I still have all of it as clear as childhood, and fell back thinking of the bed. She'd ask if I remembered things, the songs we sang, the sprig of pine I used to wave, or how the soldiers stank of wine and pickled beets. She'd ball the sheets and mutter how, outside of Ungvar, mother hit us in the leaves. She told me not to move, and Elsie'd stroke my hair and pat my head and tell me how Siberiaki drank their tea through sugar cubes they held between their teeth. I wrote a poem about it once, but everything I tried to say was incomplete. And I remember how they stared at me. When I was small, I got so sick with fever that I nearly died. But never mind that story anymore. And now she doesn't recognize the words she wrote and read from them. It's nice, she said, that someone thought so much like me and fell back smiling on the bed. This is how they do not sing. The men who lean their backs on trees, the cut of shovels and the bark of birds nailed rigid to my ears, the cold, the dirt heaped over her, and all the lights that hummed beneath a world of half-remembered images that split apart in dreams. And I remember bits of cowrie shells and candies in a crystal jar, the blink of echoed names, repeated words, and fragments of a universe I swallowed back to buzzing frequencies and emptiness. She promised, this will be the way you do not speak, all those of you who've seen the knowing lights of jellyfish, and dream forgetful darks of gulper eels who grind the shovel blades and wait and churn the patient ground. I'll just close with the, the observation that it's been my you know, privilege to have catalyzed this in one fashion or another. Uh, and my thanks to the earlier poetry bookshop which has been our local poetry miracle for a very long time now. Please support it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We have some books for sale over here. We have a little bit of food. Um, if everyone could just move the seats and put them up against the wall, um, that would be great. Thank you, everybody, for coming.